OK, good afternoon, everyone. I'm super excited to have Serena visiting us from Stanford today. So Serena is finishing her PhD in computer science at Stanford. She develops machine learning and network-based network methods for different applications like pandemics, supply chain, and polarization. And her research has been recognized by many awards, like KDD Best Paper, NSF Graduate Student Fellowship, Meta PhD Fellowship, and many other rising star awards. So this is actually a very long list. Uh, please only ask clarification questions during the talk, and you can ask more questions after the talk. Okay, that's welcome, Serena. Thank you. All right, can everyone hear me okay? Great. All right, thanks so much for that introduction. Uh, today I'm going to be presenting computational methods for human networks and high stakes decisions. So, to begin, human networks form the foundations of our society. And these networks define individuals or groups of individuals, and they allow us to capture our diverse relationships with each other. So, for example, they capture who is friends with whom and which of your friends are friends with each other. And they also capture who comes into contact with whom, for example, maybe passing each other at the same bus stop. And they also capture indirect relationships, like who consumes the same news or who buys the same products. So what I'm going to pose to you today is that many of the biggest societal challenges that we're facing are driven by these human networks. I'll give you two examples. First, pandemics are driven by human contact networks. So if a person is infected, then they have some probability of infecting their contacts. And then their contacts have some probability of infecting their contacts. So this contact network modulates the spread of the disease and thus the course of the pandemic. And pandemics, as you know, have enormous costs on lives and livelihoods, and governments have invested trillions of dollars in responding to these pandemics. So if we could better understand human contact networks, then we have the opportunity to make progress on not just responding to pandemics, but hopefully preventing future ones. As a second example, supply chains are also a major priority of governments in the US and beyond. And supply chains are fundamentally also a network problem, since the supply chain forms this network of firms, so the firms are the nodes, and the edges between firms represent buying and selling relationships between them. And so if we want to understand challenges like supply chain disruptions, then we need to understand the structure of the supply chain network and how disruptions propagate through them. So human networks also drive many other societal challenges, such as political polarization, transportation infrastructure, segregation in cities, recommender systems, and so on. And in all of these cases, effective decision making relies on understanding these human networks. But there's several challenges to understanding human networks and their relationship with decisions. The first challenge is we need to understand how do these networks actually look? What is their structure and how do they evolve over time? But the challenge is that human networks are rarely observed in data. For example, we don't know exactly who comes into contact with whom, since we don't track that kind of information, or we don't know exactly who is friends with whom. So the data sources that we do have often provide networks that are overly aggregated or only provide partial information, maybe systematically missing certain populations. So how do we develop methods that can infer networks from the data that we have? Second, once we have these networks, then we need to understand how processes evolve over these networks, for example, like disease spread, and how do these processes then inform downstream decisions? The challenge is that these processes can be very complex. So for example, when diseases spread over contact networks, transmission rates can vary based on different types of contact. Or in supply chains, how, uh, how shocks propagate depends on how firms are transforming their inputs into outputs, which can depend on hundreds of different products and parts. A final challenge is that since these are real world human networks, they aren't static. So they respond to the decisions and the policies that we're implementing, sometimes in unexpected ways. And so this means we also need to understand not only how networks are shaping decisions, but how decisions shape networks. The challenge is estimating causal effects of policies is hard, since typically we can't run randomized experiments where we randomly assign different regions to different policies. And so we have to estimate these causal effects from observational data. 
And networks further complicate this causal estimation since they violate classic assumptions of causal inference. And so in my research, I've addressed each of these three challenges with new methods. First, to address unobserved networks, I've developed statistical methods to infer fine-grained networks from aggregated data with billions of hourly edges. Second, I've developed models of propagation over networks, so both mechanistic models as well as graph neural networks. And then finally, I've extended causal inference methods for observational network data so that we can estimate the effects of policies on human networks. And I've applied my methods to high stakes applications, mainly in public health and in social sciences. In public health, I've studied a number of things, including how do we infer mobility networks from location data and model disease spread? Where do we place vaccine sites, say if we're given a budget of sites? And third, how do we estimate spillover effects of public health policies on these human networks? In social domains, a common theme of my work is measuring beliefs and behaviors from novel data sources. And here I often develop methods that com combine graph-based methods with natural language processing. For example, I've built language models to measure attitudes towards US immigrants from 140 years of political speeches. I've developed graph neural networks to study vaccine hesitancy and misinformation consumption from anonymized search logs. And I've also worked with other social data, such as social media, news articles, and course reviews. Finally, I've recently started working on supply chains as well in an ongoing collaboration with Hitachi, where we're developing graph neural networks to model propagation over large-scale supply chains. And finally, in addition to these methods and applications, my research is characterized by broad impact across computer science and beyond. So first, I collaborate regularly with experts from other fields, including epidemiology, economics, sociology, social work, biology, and more. My work also has had broad public appeal. So for example, my work received coverage from over 650 news outlets, including the New York Times and the Washington Post. And finally, I'm dedicated to transforming my research on decision making into real policy impact. So this includes deploying tools for policymakers in public health, including recommendations for vaccine site placement, as well as a dashboard to assess reopening plans during the pandemic, which won the best paper award in KDD. So with that overview today, I'm gonna to focus on COVID-19 as a concrete application so I can go through each of these challenges and explain our solutions to them. In the first part of my talk, I'll discuss network inference and specifically the problem of inferring fine-grained mobility networks from location data. And these networks are essential for the downstream goal of modeling disease spread, but they're also useful for other important problems like planning transportation infrastructure or analyzing segregation in cities. Second, I'll discuss how we integrated our mobility networks into a new epidemiological model, which allows us to realistically simulate the spread of COVID. And using our model, we'll derive key insights about reopening plans and socioeconomic disparities during the pandemic. And third, I'll discuss how we translated our research into direct policy impact. And so first, we deployed our tool as a decision support tool for the Virginia Department of Health. And separately, we evaluated the causal effects of California's pandemic policies, included unintended spillover effects. And finally, in the last part of my talk, I'll zoom out and give you a bigger picture of my work. So COVID was one of the greatest societal challenges in the last five years. So it was a natural focus of my PhD, but my methods are broadly applicable across domains. So to give you a taste of that, I'll tell you a little bit about other projects on polarization and supply chains. And finally, I'll conclude by telling you about where my research is going and my vision for future work. All right, without further ado, I'll begin with our paper that was published in uh, Nature. And this I co-led with Emma Pearson and Pang Wei Ko, along with other amazing collaborators in epidemiology, sociology, and computer science. So as we discussed, infectious diseases like COVID, they spread through the contact network between individuals. And so understanding the contact network is crucial for pandemic response, especially early in the pandemic when most uh, policy interventions were focused on limiting contact. So for example, understanding contact is crucial to understanding how to reopen safely. 
Since the risks of reopening different places depend on how many people are coming into contact at those places, in what proximity, for how long, and so on. And understanding contact is also essential to combating health disparities, since contact patterns can both create and exacerbate these disparities. However, we usually don't know the true contact network between individuals since we don't track who is coming into contact with whom. So if we don't know the true contact network, what can we do instead? Prior work has tried to get around this in a number of ways. For example, maybe you can assume the graph structure. So you could assume complete and uniform mixing, or you could model contact at a much coarser granularity, such as airline networks where you do have data. But these approaches miss important heterogeneity at local levels. Another option is to add many parameters to some epidemiological model, for example, transmission rates for every neighborhood, to make up for missing the contact network. But the challenge with this approach is that data to fit these models is quite scarce, and so models with many parameters tend to overfit on the available data, and they struggle with generalization and identifiability. So our solution instead is to infer fine-grained mobility networks directly from aggregated location data, and then to use these networks as proxies for contact. And our basic premise was this. If you can successfully infer these complex fine-grained networks from data, then your model can actually be quite simple. So the networks end up absorbing much of the complexity of disease spread so that you no longer need so many parameters, but you can still accurately model the spread of disease across epidemics. So this brings me to the first methods part of my talk, where I'll talk about how to infer fine-grained mobility networks from location data. So in our network inference problem, ideally what we want are hourly visits from people to places so that we can model the spread of infection based on who is visiting where at the same time. However, most location data doesn't provide such fine-grained networks, so at best, they provide aggregated visits over these neighborhoods and places. So for example, in our work, we use data from SafeGraph. And SafeGraph data is aggregated to the level of census block groups, or CBGs. These are local neighborhoods of around 600 to 3,000 people. And they also provide visit counts for points of interest, or POIs, which are public locations, such as restaurants or grocery stores. And SafeGraph has individual GPS pings, but they provide aggregated data in order to preserve privacy. So given this data, we want to keep it aggregated, but we want to reconcile the total visits at P CBGs and at POIs so that we have the full network of visits from CBGs to POIs. So specifically, we want to infer this bipartite network that tells us in every hour how many people in each CBG visited each POI. So what exactly does SafeGraph provide? As discussed, we have the hourly number of visits to each C POI, and we also have the hourly number of people from each CBG who are out of the house and visiting POIs. And conveniently, SafeGraph also computes monthly estimates of where each POI's visitors are coming from in terms of their home CBGs. So this gives us the network that we want, but at a monthly instead of an hourly granularity. So our key insight is that we can use an algorithm called Iterative Proportional Fitting, or IPF, to reconcile these two data sources so that we can infer hourly CBG POI networks. So to take a step back, IPF is a classic statistical algorithm. You might know it by other names, such as Sinkhorn's algorithm or biproportional fitting. So IPF generally takes in as input an initial matrix, and it takes in target row marginals P, so that's what you want the rows to sum to, and then it takes in target column marginals Q, which is what you want the columns to sum to. Then IPF tries to solve the matrix balancing problem, which is to find diagonal matrices D0 and D1 such that scaling X by D0 and D1 matches those target marginals. And the way that IPF does this is by iteratively scaling the rows and then the columns of the matrix. So let me show you what I mean. Specifically on even iterations, IPF scales the rows to match the row marginals, so we adjust D0. And then on odd iterations, IPF scales the columns to match the column marginals, so now we're adjusting D1 based on the most recent version of D0. And so you have these iterations going back and forth, adjusting D0 and then adjusting D1. 
And it's well known that if these iterations converge, IPF will find a fitted matrix that matches the target marginals, but not only that, that fitted matrix will be otherwise as similar as possible to the initial matrix X in terms of minimizing the callback Liebler or KL divergence to X. So our key idea is that we can formulate our network inference problem in terms of IPF. So we have these hourly visitors from CBGs and to POIs, and those act as the target marginals. And then we can also treat the monthly network as the initial matrix. So then by using IPF, we can infer these hourly CBG POI networks where these hourly networks match the given hourly marginals, but otherwise remain as similar as possible to the monthly network. So since IPF is such a rich method, we're gonna unpack this a little bit to try to ask why is this a good idea to do here? And so in this new work, first I wanna say that we observe that this problem, we, uh, this, this problem that we describe with safe graph data is really a more general one where we wanna infer a dynamic network from its three dimensional marginals, meaning its time varying row sums, its time varying column sums, and the time aggregated network. And beyond mobility, this problem appears commonly across other domains as well, where it's easier to observe the marginals of the network as opposed to its interiors. So for example, in transportation, we might observe the swipes going into and out of subway turnstiles, but it's harder to observe which uh, station each person is going to and where they're coming from. Or in migration, we might easily observe the inflows and outflows of regions, but it's harder to know the paths that people are taking, where they're moving from or going to. And so in these settings, IPF poses an attractive method, but because it deals with marginals, but IPF has mainly been used in matrix balancing, where the goal is to fit a matrix to target marginals, but there's no explicit network that you're trying to infer. So our question in this work is, why is IPF a good idea here? And more specifically, under what model is IPF a reasonable estimator of a dynamic network from its marginals? So in our work, we answer this question by finding a generative network model under which IPF in fact recovers the maximum likelihood estimates of the network's parameters. So in our model, the time varying network XT is a scaled version of the time aggregated network X bar drawn from a Poisson distribution. And then each entry is scaled by a parameter for the row UI and a parameter for the column VJ. So in this model, we observe the time aggregated network X bar, but we don't observe the scaling parameters or the time varying network. However, what helps is that we do observe the marginals of the time varying network, meaning its row sums and its column sums in every hour. And we show in fact that these marginals form sufficient statistics for the model. So our main result is that under this model, IPF recovers the maximum likelihood estimates of the scaling parameters U and V. And I'll skip the proof for now, but the basic idea is that the log likelihood of our model is equivalent to the dual of the KL divergence problem implied by IPF. Also, one caveat of our main result is that it requires the IPF iterations to converge, and I'll come back to what we do if the IPF iterations don't converge. But for now, let's discuss some implications. Yes, please. On the model, yeah. Is there any intuitive interpretation of the scaling parameters? Like yeah. the Poisson distribution makes perfect sense. Right? Yeah, because it's I'm perfect. getting fewer temporal observations. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so let's think about it, for example, in the, the CBG POI context. So then the CBGs are the rows and the POIs are the columns. So you could think about the UIs and the VJs as scaling factors on the CBGs and the POIs in every single hour. So for example, for CBG scaling factors, it would be like maybe younger populations go out more after work, but older populations go out more during the day. And then for POI scaling factors, it would be like maybe bars are visited more uh, at night, especially on weekends, and then schools are visited more during the day, during the week. Yeah, yeah good question. All right, so some implications of our result. First, we've answered our question. So we found the model under which IPF is a reasonable estimator of uh, inferring a dynamic network from its marginals. Specifically under this model, IPF returns the maximum likelihood estimate of the network parameters. And in fact, we should interpret IPF as trying to estimate the expected values of the network. 
And second, our model reveals implicit assumptions we're making about the network when we use IPF to infer it. So for example, IPF is the most justified when these expected values of the time varying network XT are a rank one modification of the time aggregated network X bar and each value is sampled independently following a Poisson distribution. And since this network problem appears across domains, it's quite useful to make these assumptions explicit so that future practitioners can evaluate whether these assumptions actually make sense in their domain. And third, our network model enables several new analyses of IPF. So for example, we're now able to quantify uncertainty in the IPF parameters, which is not given by the IPF algorithm itself. And we're able to evaluate IPF's estimation error on the true network parameters, so U and V, as opposed to only evaluating IPF's ability to fit the target marginals, which is how IPF was originally evaluated. And so finally, coming back to this question of IPF convergence, Theory on IPF has decades of literature characterizing exactly when IPF does and doesn't converge, but there's actually very few principled strategies for what to do when IPF doesn't converge, which is essential if you want to then use IPF for some downstream problem. So a second contribution of our work is an efficient algorithm that minimally perturbs the IPF inputs so that IPF converges, but otherwise keeps the network structure as similar as possible. So I won't go into this algorithm for now, for time, but I'm happy to talk about it more during the Q&A uh, if you have questions. So for now, let's come back to where we paused. We now have a justification for using IPF to infer these hourly CBG POI networks from aggregated location data. And so we applied IPF to infer hourly CBG POI networks in 10 of the largest metropolitan areas in the US uh, from March to May 2020. So this is the first wave of the COVID pandemic. And we've talked a lot about the theoretical properties of IPF, but one of its empirical advantages is that it's very lightweight because we're able to compute all of the row factors in parallel and we compute all of the column factors in parallel. And so because of this, we're able to infer these large scale mobility networks with 500,000 POIs, 57,000 CBGs, and 5.4 billion hourly edges. And we've also released our networks in agreement with SafeGraph. You're welcome to take a look. They've been downloaded by hundreds of researchers and used in various follow-on studies. So this concludes the first part of my talk where we've discussed inferring networks from aggregated data. Now we're gonna use these networks to model disease spread and analyze different strategies for pandemic response. So we integrated our mobility networks into an epidemiological model. We use a standard compartmental design where we assume that individuals can be in one of four disease states, susceptible, exposed, infectious, and removed. And the key to our model is that we maintain disease states for each CBG, each census block group, and we use mobility networks to determine how people across CBGs come into contact with each other. So to develop some intuition, let's start with a toy example. So let's say we only have two CBGs for now, and let's say everyone is susceptible except one person in CBG B who is infectious. So let's say that susceptible person and that infectious person, they show up at the same POI. And now there is some chance that the infectious person infects the susceptible person, and let's say unfortunately that happens. So now the susceptible person becomes exposed, meaning that they've become infected, but they're not yet infectious. And then both people go home, and after some time, the exposed person also becomes infectious. So we also model a second type of transmission that is separate from POI visits. So this we call home transmission that happens in your home CBG. And let's say that happens here, and now we have two infected people in each CBG. So this was a simple example, but it shows us how the model combines mobility networks and disease states in order to model the spread of infectious diseases like COVID. I also wanted to mention that we can model POI specific probabilities of infection based on other data that we have about the POI, including the POI's area and square feet and median dwell time, which is how long visitors stay on average when they visit. As long as, along with the number of infectious visitors, which is endogenous to the model, and current levels of mask wearing, which we get from external data. So altogether, our work can be described by this pipeline. First, we infer the mobility networks from the aggregated location data using IPF. 
Then the networks, along with many other ingredients, go into our epidemiological model. We learn the free parameters of our model by fitting it to reported daily case counts. And then we use our fitted model to conduct all sorts of analyses. So incorporating so much real world data means that our model can actually be very simple, as I originally promised. So our model actually only has three free parameters, literally three numbers, not e share, they're shared across CVGs and POIs, three numbers which are fixed over time. And despite this, we're still able to fit all sorts of case curves during the first wave of the pandemic. So here the blue line represents our model predictions and the orange line represents uh, reported daily cases with weekly smoothing. And our simple model is able to fit linear trajectories like in Chicago, but it can also fit harder curves like cases that plateaued like in Philly or even cases that went downward like in New York. And this shows the power of our mobility networks because they enable our simple model to fit complex case curves. And we perform many robustness checks on model fitting. For example, we compared our model, which uses these IPF inferred networks, to an aggregate mobility model that still receives the total hourly mobility, so basically a time series saying how many visits there are in every single hour. So this aggregate mobility model still receives that time series, which means that it is able to see the huge dip in mobility at the beginning of the pandemic, but it doesn't receive the network. And we find that our network-based model substantially outperforms this aggregate mobility model with a 42% decrease in RMSE. And that demonstrates the importance of the inferred hourly networks. We also tried simulating disease spread with known parameters, and we show that our model fitting procedure was able to recover the true parameters in all 10 metropolitan areas. And we also conducted a large number of sensitivity analyses. To summarize the results, we found that none of these changes really made a difference, except in our POI transmission rate analysis, where we found that our original parametric form, where we include area and square feet, median dwell time, et cetera, was the best in terms of, of matching real world data. So, oh, yes. The three parameters, are yeah. those just um, uh, scale factors and transitions between the four? Components? Yeah, there's scale factors on the transmission rates. And so the POIs all share one scaling factor. Um, we have POI specific transmission rates that are based on the area and square feet, median dwell time, and so on, but it's all multiplied by the same scaling factor. So that's one of the uh, parameters. The other one is uh, an analogous scaling factor for the CBG transmission rate. And then the third one is the initial proportion infected. Did you look at, sorry if I'm, no, no, it's not me if that's too much. Um, did you look at, uh, D, so like for, um, say beta, the um, yeah. infection rate, yeah. uh, did you look at decompositions of that based on any sort of virality data that could, like, yeah. I'm want, like you're, you're fitting that as yeah. a free parameter, but I would yeah. often think like the remainder here is more likely what pe uh, I would think epidemiologists can pinpoint. Yeah. And the problem is usually all of these social factors that right. you rolled up can't be estimated accurately. Yeah, so. this is a good question. So we didn't look so much at the POI specific rates. We did rank them across each other to see more like relatively which ones are uh, more risky versus less. Uh, we spend less time on what the exact number is. One thing we did do though is we looked at the R naught that comes out of our model. So R naught is the number of people that you infect given that you've been infected. Um, and we use the R naught, like we use reasonable numbers of R naught to cal uh, calibrate what the parameter sets we even search over are. Um, so I'm happy to talk more about this later. Um, okay, great. So now we have a working model. What can we use it for? And so we use it for two types of analyses. First, we use it for retrospective analyses. So remember, we have this model that realistically simulates who got infected where and when down to the individual CBG, the POI, and the hour. So this allows us to analyze disparities in risk, such as which CBGs were the most at risk and which POIs are the riskiest to visit. And second, we can use the model for forward-facing experiments. So since our model takes in a series of interpretable inputs, we can then modify any of those inputs and run the model forward to see how the predicted infections change. So to demonstrate these capabilities, I'll go over two example use cases of the model. First, we used our model to test a partial reopening strategy. So that's where we reopen all POIs, but we cap visits at each POI to some percentage of its maximum occupancy. And then we evaluate each reopening strategy based on two objectives. 
So on one hand, we want more visits because those serve as a proxy for, say, the economy, for consumer needs, for businesses, and so on. But on the other hand, of course, we want to minimize infections. So as expected, these are competing objectives, meaning that more visits lead to more disease spread and infections. But the exciting result is that the relationship is highly nonlinear, meaning a small reduction in visits can lead to a large reduction in infections. So for example, if we use a 20% occupancy cap, we lose around 40% of visits, but we reduce predicted infections by 80%. And the strategy works so well because it disproportionately reduces visits from POIs during their high density risky hours, but it allows businesses to return as usual everywhere else. We can also use our model to study socioeconomic disparities. And what was remarkable was that we didn't give our model access to socioeconomic data. It didn't know which CBGs were lower income, which CBGs were higher income. But based on the mobility networks alone, it correctly predicted that lower income and less white CBGs were getting infected at significantly higher rates. And so then we wondered, how is the model able to predict these disparities solely from the mobility networks? So we found that there are two reasons. First, lower income and less white CBGs weren't able to reduce their mobility as much. And this could be because they're disproportionately represented in essential jobs or less able to work from home. But second, it's not just how often people go out, but where they go. And we found that people from lower income CBGs and less white CBGs tended to visit POIs that were smaller and more crowded with longer visit times and therefore riskier under the model. For example, we found on average that one trip to the grocery store was two times riskier for someone from a lower income CBG compared to someone from a higher income CBG. And these findings reveal that mobility could be playing a substantial role in why we see demographic differences in infection rates, which then informs how policymakers tackle these disparities. So when we, received, when we released this work, we were excited to see the public reception. We received coverage from over 650 news outlets, including an interactive article in the New York Times. Our paper actually received one of the most online attention of all papers ever published by Nature. Our work was also cited by various policymakers and institutions. Governments around the world cited us when they released their public health policies. For example, you can actually see here one of the figures from our paper that was remade by the office of the prime minister in Poland to be printed in a Polish newspaper. And we were also cited in two amicus briefs for the US Supreme Court and by the CDC, the New York Times editorial board, and the US Joint Economic Committee. But what I'm most proud of is, aside from all of this coverage and these citations, we were then able to really take all of this attention that our work received and translate it into direct policy impact. And that's what I'm gonna talk about now. And so to create that tangible impact, we wanted to directly support policymakers with decision support tools. And to do this, we partnered with researchers at the University of Virginia who were advising the Virginia Department of Health on pandemic policies. And they reached out to us about the department's need for data-driven tools to assess potential reopening plans. And so together, we transformed our model into a new dashboard that allowed the Virginia Department of Health to test thousands of different reopening policies so that they could analyze trade-offs between mobility and predicted infections. Creating this dashboard required substantial effort, such as new features, a computational infrastructure, fitting the model to new regions and a new time period, and new visualizations based on our discussions with the department. And so in recognition of our efforts, this paper won the best paper award in KDD in the applied data science track. However, one thing that we weren't able to capture at the beginning of the pandemic was how people actually responded to policies. So for example, under our original model, we assume that if you close gyms, then people just don't go to gyms. But one complication with this theory is when neighboring regions have differing policies. So for example, let's say one county is under lockdown while its neighbors are still open. And in this setting, are people spilling over from the more restricted to the less restricted areas? And this patchwork of policies is actually a common problem in the US where regions often differ 
due to differing uh, preferences or differing politics and circumstances. For example, beyond COVID, gun control, marijuana, abortion are all examples of these patchworks. And under these patchworks, the opportunity for spillovers is ripe. And these spillovers can severely undermine the intended effects of local policies. And so this brings me to the final paper in the section, which I'll discuss, uh, discuss quite briefly. This paper was recently published in AAAI. And in this work, our goal is to estimate these geographic spillover effects of local policies. But there's a lot of challenges to estimating these effects. First, you can't run experiments where you randomly assign regions to policies. And second, since spillovers arise specifically when regions have their own local policies, then each region might have its own definition of the policy and how that policy is assigned. And so it's hard to find a consistent treatment that you can then use for causal inference. And finally, one of the biggest challenges in observational studies is confounders. So for example, here, if you wanted to estimate the effect of a COVID policy on mobility, then COVID severity serves as a confounder, since higher COVID rates can both predict a more restrictive policy, but mobility might go down on its own since people are afraid of higher COVID rates, and you can't attribute that change in mobility to the policy itself. So our work addresses each of these challenges First, we identified a unique policy setting, which is the California Blueprint for a Safer Economy that lends itself very nicely to natural experiments. So in this setting, all 58 California counties, they were assigned to tiers based on cutoffs of COVID metrics like case rate or test positivity. And so each tier represents a bundle of mobility restrictions from the most restrictive to the least restrictive. And the setting is really ideal for our analysis because the tiers are defined in the same way across different counties, but tier assignments can be different at the same time, which incentivizes spillovers. Furthermore, since these tiers are assigned at the cutoffs of COVID metrics, then we can use regression discontinuity design or RDD to estimate local unconfounded spillover effects. So that's the basic idea of this work. Under this RDD framework, we're gonna estimate spillover effects by fitting a model to the mobility network. And using our model, we do in fact find significant spillovers during the COVID pandemic in California. So we see these spillovers from more restricted to less restricted counties with larger effects in retail, gyms, and eating places. This heterogeneity in effect size could both reflect what people are willing to travel for and also what the tiers were actually restricting. So for example, grocery stores were generally open even under the most restrictive tier, so there's no reason to spill over for them. And second, based on our fitted model, we compared county level restrictions to statewide restrictions in terms of how much mobility they're actually reducing. And even though this is under the simplifications of our model, we do find this substantial difference between them with county level restrictions being only 54% as effective as statewide restrictions at reducing mobility. So this demonstrates the importance of taking these spillovers and strategic behavior into account when planning policies because they have these substantial effects. And thinking about, as we said at the beginning, not only how networks shape decisions, but how decisions shape networks. And so this concludes our main story for today. To summarize the contributions, first we discuss network inference, where we develop the theoretical basis for using IPF to infer dynamic networks, and then we applied IPF to infer these large scale mobility networks from location data. Second, we developed a new epidemiological model that integrates our mobility networks to analyze both reopening plans and disparities during the pandemic. And third, we translated our model into direct policy impact by designing a decision support tool for the Virginia Department of Health. And then we analyzed the actual impact of policies, including unintended spillover effects. So in the remaining time, I wanna zoom out a bit and come back to the big picture. Today, I focused on COVID as a concrete application, but human networks are applicable to many other domains, including polarization, misinformation, supply chains, and more. And also, my work focuses on human networks, but I'm also interested in human behaviors and attitudes more broadly and understanding them using a mix of network and NLP methods. So to give you a sense of this breadth, I'll tell you briefly about a few more projects. First, in this PNAS paper, we developed language models to study immigration and polarization trends from political speeches. 
So here we acquired the congressional record from 1880 to 2020, which includes 140 years and 17 million speeches. We train language models to identify the speeches that were about immigration and then to classify them as pro, anti, or neutral towards immigrants. And when we applied our models to all speeches, we found on one hand that overall attitudes towards immigrants are more positive than ever. But our paper also finds that the parties are more polarized than ever on immigration. And so Republican speeches from today are in fact as negative as the average speech from the 1920s, which was an era of strict immigration quotas. And our paper also includes other results on how immigrants are linguistically framed in these speeches, including using water metaphors or implicitly dehumanizing language. In another recent project, which is joint work with Adam Forney and Eric Horvitz at Microsoft, we studied vaccine trends and misinformation from search logs. So the basic premise of this work is that anonymized search logs present opportunities to understand vaccine uptake and vaccine hesitancy in new ways. So here we develop a graph neural network to detect vaccine intent, which is when a user is trying to get the COVID vaccine on, on Bing. So for example, they might look up COVID vaccine near me or where can I get a COVID vaccine? And queries like this are easy to detect, but in order to identify a large set of queries and clicks uh, on URLs, our GNN utilizes both language clues as well as what's called the query click graph. So this is another bipartite network that's between queries and URLs. And an edge between a query and a URL means that you queried this URL and then you clicked on this, sorry, you, query, you, you issued this query and then you clicked on this URL as a search result. And this graph-based approach allows us to accurately detect vaccine intent. So our model actually achieves AUCs above 0.9 in all 50 states, and our estimated vaccine rates correlate highly with CDC vaccine rates. And then using our GNN, we can do a number of things. First, we build the most comprehensive data set of zip level of COVID vaccine rates. This is significant since zip codes are 10 times the granularity of counties, which are the finest grain data that the CDC releases. And second, we use our GNN to identify a large number of vaccine holdouts. So these are people who waited a really long time to show their first vaccine intent. And then we compare them to early adopters matched on covariates. And we find that holdouts are 69% likelier to click on untrusted news. And we also discover their vaccine concerns directly from their clicks. The last project I wanted to mention brings us back to human networks, but now in the context of supply chains. And this is an ongoing collaboration with Hitachi. So shocks can propagate in supply chains, resulting in major disruptions. Shock propagation is somewhat similar in spirit to disease propagating over uh, contact networks, but there's a unique feature to shock propagation. And that is for a given firm, when it has a shortage in input products, only its output products that rely on those inputs are affected. So for example, here, the firm's production of wheels is affected, but not its production of nails. So in order to accurately model shocks on supply chains, we need to learn each firm's production function, meaning how each firm is transforming its inputs into its outputs. And this actually poses an interesting new setting for graph machine learning, where we have a dynamic network and each node's out edge is constrained by its in edges and some unknown production functions. And supply chains are a canonical example, but such networks also appear in other contexts, such as biological networks or organizational networks. And existing models for dynamic link prediction may fail under these settings since they can't take into account which out edges are affected by which in edges. So in our project, we're designing the first graph neural network for this setting. And our model blends graph machine learning with techniques from temporal causal discovery, since our problem of inferring these production functions is closely related to temporal causal discovery. And the hope is that our model will jointly both predict future edges, as well as learn these internal production functions so that it can accurately model supply chains and other complex networks. So this work on supply chains brings me back to the core of my research at the intersection of human networks and decision making. From the beginning of my talk, we discussed these three fundamental challenges at this intersection. First, how do these networks look? Second, how do processes unfold over these networks and inform decisions? And third, how do these decisions shape networks? So today we've studied these challenges in the context of COVID, but in future work, I'd love to explore these challenges in other domains. 
So for example, in supply chains, uh, the same three challenges come up. For example, supply chain visibility is a notorious problem since firms in the supply chain have very little visibility beyond their tier one suppliers and their tier one buyers because firms are not quick to offer up this sort of information. So we need new data sources that can capture these partial views of the supply chain that we have and then methods to infer and combine these different views into a larger graph. And second, Processes over supply chain networks, like shock propagation, are complex. And so we need new methods like these GNNs that we're developing in order to model these processes. And third, we need to understand how new supply chain strategies change the network. So for example, if firms are using redundancy to improve resilience, or if they're getting better at finding substitutes when their supply is disrupted. And so these three challenges are fundamental, and they will continue to appear across many high stakes domains at the intersection of human networks and decision making. Having identified these challenges, another future direction I'm excited about is working on these challenges in tandem instead of thinking about these challenges separately. Let me give you two examples. First, one idea combines questions one and two with implications for privacy. So that is, instead of immediately trying to answer, how do these networks look, we should first ask ourselves, what do we need to know about the network in order to make a good decision? For example, in the pandemic setting, for high level decisions like, should I sh uh, shut down an entire city or not, then you probably don't need the individual contact network to make the right decision. So can we characterize these trade-offs between privacy and decision making under different network structures and different types of decisions. Another idea combines questions two and three. So that is, instead of modeling decisions based on past networks and then evaluating how decisions shape networks, can we do that all in one step by incorporating adaptive behaviors into our modeling? So previously, for example, we estimated the spillover effects from the historical mobility networks. Now, can we actually come up with realistic models of human behavior that would yield these spillovers as well as other behaviors? For example, we could model the mobility network as choices that individuals are making about where to go based on their current preferences and the options that they have. So a model like this would naturally capture spillovers because one county going under lockdown appears as options being removed from the choice set, and then individuals have the option of going to another place or to not go at all, which is the outside option. And that would be a specific model for mobility. I'm also interested in building general purpose models where we can harness LLMs to represent social agents and hopefully construct these complex simulation systems of uh, social, uh, social networks. So along these lines, we have a current project on generating realistic social networks with LLMs where we're designing different prompting methods for zero shot social network generation. And finally, in future work, I remain very committed to translating research into real world impact. Looking into the future, unfortunately, there's no shortage of global crises with human networks at their core. So not only pandemics and supply chain disruptions, but also climate change, the spread of misinformation, polarization, and more. So I hope to develop methods that can support these crises and see my research all the way through from methods to applications to impact, so that we can empower policymakers to make more effective and human-centered decisions for all. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, any questions? So I can ask. A, I yes, can first yes. ask a question. So you mentioned that there seems to be a trade-off between network quality and the number of parameters. If we have a yeah. very good network, yeah. then there's only like three parameters using, using your method. Yeah. And the network is actually collected from safe graph data, collected yeah. from like major cities with, I assume, lots of users. Yeah. So what if like we collect such data from places with less users yeah. and we have an imperfect network? Yeah. Should we use more parameters to get an accurate model? Yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting question. 
Um, so to repeat the question, it's basically saying, uh, in this case, we had safe graph for some of the biggest cities in the US, lots of people, so we can infer these large scale networks. The question is, for places where maybe we have less data, the network inference is more imperfect, and so should we basically correct for that using the model parameters? I think that is one thing you could do. I think you would want to correct for the network in more like informed ways, like using some sort of domain knowledge about how the data is actually collected. So even in these large scale cities, we do understand certain things about the safe graph data. And so safe graph data tends to be uh, undercovered for certain populations, like maybe seniors are less likely to carry cell phones, uh, children are less likely to carry cell phones. Uh, there's been a really interesting study that was released in fact by Amanda Costin and others where they actually compared safe graph mobility data to ground truth voter registration data. So they did an audit study of SafeGraph data where they could show where SafeGraph is actually undercovered. So I think in this case, you would want to have like a really good domain understanding of how SafeGraph data is collected and then try to correct for those data biases in a more directed way as opposed to just like introducing model parameters loosely into your model and then only fitting on the downstream COVID cases. Because the downstream COVID cases, at this point, we only had one number for each day in the city. It's like 60 data points. And so it really isn't very much to fit your model on. Okay, yes. thank you. Any other questions, please? Yeah. Uh, so thank you, this is super interesting work. Uh, and one question that I have is uh, uh, often like if you study any one of those processes and then yeah. have policies that impact it, yeah. they can often be like side effects on any related policy. And I'm thinking like mm -hmm. if we restrict, for example, human mobility yeah. in a certain way, well, yeah. maybe that can affect nutrition because that affects the grocery stores mm -hmm. they can get to. Mm -hmm. So what are your thoughts about like, connections between different uh, like you know human networks policies for one application yeah. can change the human network that can have an impact on maybe another application yeah i mean that's fascinating i mean i think I think that is one reason I like networks so much, which is just the world is so inter interconnected, right? Everything is interconnected. Uh, sorry, to repeat the question also. So it was saying that uh, policies can have interconnected effects on other policies, right? So the example being maybe you restrict mobility, uh, for, uh, but then because you're restricting mobility, then people can't go to groceries, and so now there's problems with diet, and, and people are not able to get the food that they need. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that is the sort of ho the downstream hope of having these large scale simulation systems where you can actually incorporate multiple policies at once. So here, at least, you could look at maybe within pandemics, uh, the combination of maybe closing down grocery stores and restaurants at the same time. But I think the end goal would be, can you actually incorporate even more policies on top of that? And to be able to observe in the real mobility data, what is the outcome of this sort of policy? Do you see that people, for example, can no longer go to grocery stores? Maybe you could combine that with search logs data to say then, oh, well, if people can't go to grocery stores, how are they information seeking instead uh, to try to find uh, the, the nu nutrition that they need? And then how are different communities, like maybe certain com marginalized communities have fewer options, they have less delivery and so on, or less ability to make up for the, the missing options. And so I think some sort of holistic view View that really incorporates all of these different data sources and all of these problems is quite interesting. Thanks. Uh, yes, yeah. so, um, I wanted to ask you if you can share with us uh, your thoughts about uh, the performance challenges that you face during the network inference. Yeah. And I can think of, of at least two different ones. One is IPF is not very fast. Oh, uh, yeah. Second is when you run simulation. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how big your graph is, but I, I know people who work on simulations, they face performance challenges. Uh -huh. If you want to scale this, this up to yeah. the entire world, then yeah. uh, it's really a challenge to do to run the simulation. Totally. Yeah, 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 yeah. happy to talk about this. So the question is about performance challenges and how do you scale up these sort of methods to very large graphs. Um, so in our, in our case, we did find that IPF was actually quite quick. Like I was saying, the the row factors can all be computed in parallel, and then the column factors can be computed in parallel. We ran this for 100 iterations for each hour. Uh, even though the iterations didn't always converge, we showed in later, uh, in later work that actually within the first like 10 iterations or so, IP get, IPF gets very close to its final estimated network. And so the final iterations, like the final thousand iterations you might have to run are just about getting it to converge, but it doesn't change the estimated network very much. So you could actually get this down to like 10 iterations. We ran it for 100 just to be safe. And so uh, IPF didn't take very long, and you can also do this for all of the hours in parallel. Um, as long as your machine is able to scale to parallel computation. Um, but the nice thing is because we made a, de a decoupled problem, so we're estimating the network in every single hour, but there's no dependencies between the hours, then we are able to estimate every single hour uh, in parallel. And so that, that didn't actually take that long. 
Um, in terms of then taking these inferred networks and then putting them into the epidemiological model, um, that wasn't, we, again, we were able to parallelize that as well. Like we were able to run um, parallel simulations where we used like different parameter sets for every single city. Um, and we tried to uh, keep multiple parameter sets for each city in order to maintain uncertainty over the model parameters. So we kept all parameter sets that were within 20% of the RMSC of the best fitting parameters. And then for each parameter set, we ran 30 stochastic simulations. And so for each city, we could run these uh, simulations in parallel again. And because the networks, they were large, but they were quite sparse. So we always represent them as sparse matrices, uh, we weren't too inhibited by these sort of uh, computational problems. Um, that said, I think there would be computational problems if you did want to expand to the entire US. Um, and so I think at that point, you might have to come up with, with new methods for distributed computing and so on. So I think that would be an interesting challenge. Yeah. Yes. Uh, my question is mostly about uh, noise in the data that you observe. So because yeah. you're observing like limited information. Yeah. And let's take the example of the row marginals and the column marginals. Yeah. Suppose like one number is like very corrupted. Yeah. How does that sort of affect the solution that you recover? That's yeah. one thing. Yeah. And secondly, like because we're using this information to sort of like inform like real world decisions, yeah. we probably want like red flagging when something like this happens. Yes, yeah, like red flagging if the data is that noisy. Yeah. Yeah. So I think um so this is definitely an issue. Um, I think in our case, we think more about corruption in the, the time aggregated network than the marginals. We assume the marginals are easier to estimate and there's a reason for that. So for example, let's say in like the subway turnstile example, you could observe the turnstile data perfectly. Like you can see exactly when people are going in and when people are going out. In the safe graph data, it's also easier to attribute uh, a single device to visiting a POI or a single device to coming from a home CBG. Like for attribution to a home CBG, uh, like you observe where the device is over repeated nights, so you have a lot more data for that kind of thing. We assume that most of the noise is actually in the time aggregated network, and so that's um, that's where our uh, algorithm that I mentioned earlier for achieving IPF convergence comes in. And so if the uh, time aggregated network is corrupted enough, IPF actually won't converge. Um, because one of the conditions for IPF convergence comes down to that aggregated network. Um, in a nutshell, that condition basically says for every single subset of rows, the total row marginal over those rows must be less than or equal to the total column marginal for the columns that are connected to those rows. And so the problem is if that time aggregated network, if it has zeros where it shouldn't have zeros, then the subset of rows will be missing columns that it should actually be connected to. And so the way that we deal with that in our algorithm is that we connect rows uh, to columns in, in a way that minimizes changes to the network. So I'm happy to talk about that more. All right, thank you.